freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your first look for this week's Memorial Tournament. And joining me to break it all down, Sia Najad is here. Sia, happy, I guess technically it's Sunday. <laughs> well, still, it's happy. We're watching golf. We're talking about golf. We're talking about the Memorial next week. And uh, man, we got we got a lot to sweat right now, but I can't wait to talk about the Memorial because uh, I, I'm already kind of Fishing through the hot plays, which of course we'll we'll disclose tomorrow on the DFS show, but I'm super excited about it. I wasn't going to date the show, uh, but I did it immediately within the first 15 seconds. <laughs> so we are this is Sunday afternoon that we are doing this. Greg Ducharme also joining us. Greg, good to have you, bud. Don't date it. Don't date it. Don't date it. <laughs> I know, it's that's May I 30th at 3:52. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's what happens. So um, exactly what look, I, I think it's best to be open open about it. But anyway. I'm really excited for the Memorial, too. Um, I'm excited to see a new golf course. I'm excited to see some that, of these big names play. Yeah. There, there's a lot to look forward to. I, that is why I believe a first look is so critically important this week, because this is a, a course, there, there's a lot to go through. So, Sia, not only did we get one event here last year, we got two events. This was uh, the Workday Charity Open, and then the following week was the Memorial. So, as we start to look for this time around, and we'll, we'll get into the renovations in a second, uh, if you're looking for course history, it's not often that you get two events at the same course, back-to-back -back weeks like we got last year. Yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting to be able to kind of delve into two different tournaments, obviously. So uh, I, I like that. I mean, I, I'm going to look at sort of the same metrics anyway, but in terms of sort of where players finished and, and how players fit for this particular course on two different occasions, we certainly have more to look at. This was the site of John Rahm's uh, bogey herd round the world. Greg is bogey chipping this unbelievable shot that he hits on 16 green side. He's going nuts. He thinks it's for birdie. He gets assessed the two shots after the round for making the ball move. It does not impact the result of the event, but I assume we are going to see that highlight countless times this week. Yeah, and it gave us a great gift too, right? I mean, that, yeah, that's that one of the more common ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's great. The interesting thing about last year's Memorial and the Workday is how different those two courses played. I mean, right. it, it was at the same course, but it was basically a different golf course. You had one was um, in the uh, the Memorial. The last one, it was like a tramp. The greens were like a trampoline. So the ball was bouncing like crazy. The rough was really long. It was really firm and fast. Played extremely difficult. The week before, it was much softer. Um, whole locations were much more accessible. The greens were much more receptive. And you saw much better scoring great theater and both. Um, but now we get a third golf course. And so right after they kind of were able to let it go for the Memorial last year, because they're going to redo all the, all the grass and reconstruct some of the greens and redo the bunkers and add some trees. So um, yeah, it's like, while we've had this event a lot in the last year, we've played this course a lot in the last year, it's almost like we're going to have three different golf courses um, at the end of next week. Yeah, they did not even wait for the final round to be completed. They were ripping up greens, essentially following the final group out there, ripping it up on the spot. It's like, hey, we got to do this in 11 months or whatever. We might as well get going. And, and here are the big changes. And 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 I'm going to start with Sia, but Greg, I'm very interested in your take on these because there's, there's a lot of changes here. Yeah. Um, every single green was reconstructed with new bent grass. Uh, only greens... 12, 13, 14, and 17 Sia even resemble the old greens. A lot of them have been kind of recontoured. Every fairway and greenside bunker was rebuilt. Some of them have been adjusted and strategically repositioned. So I don't even know how much of course history slash tournament history we want to even be taking into consideration for this week. Yeah, it's interesting. And my understanding is that there, there's a few fairways that are are not quite as wide as they were prior to the renovations as well. So, and and again, we can kind of mine this as the week goes, but yeah, it, you know, I, I am going to be looking at course history. The good news is regardless of course history, we, we do know what this course has to offer. We do know that it's still going to be a big approach course. We do know that it's still going to be a big around the green course. And, and probably you're going to have to look at golfers who are good out of the bunker and, and things of that nature, because there are a lot of sand traps around here. So uh, the good news is, 
I'm going to be focused on those things. The proximity is 150 to 175, 175 to 200. I'm going to put a slightly special focus on that. Uh, but you're right. As far as the course history goes, it is going to be a little different. So, so I may not emphasize that quite as much. This was a big project, Greg. I mean, they added about 100 yards. You look at hole 15, I think, is a great example. It's completely different. They removed a creek. They lowered the fairway 10 to 15 feet. They That means it's going to play a little bit short. They added a new fairway bunker. It's got a brand, new, a, a brand new green complex and water feature. I mean, there are going to be holes that look and play entirely different than some of these guys have seen for the last couple of decades. Yes, um, which is very true. But at the same time, the players on the PGA Tour are very good at, at learning a golf course in just a couple of days. Uh, they have great access to great information. Um, and, and in just a couple of practice rounds, they can learn a golf course. In terms of metrics, when you're looking at who's going to be successful, I, I think Sia's point of using still the same kind of metrics is is a valid one because although it's different, it's still the same architect. It's still Jack Nicholas. His concepts right. still apply, in my opinion. So he's still going to be asking players the same kind of questions. Um, sometimes when you're redoing grass, like they're redoing irrigation work, they're putting a mm -hmm. um, they're they're putting a, a precision air system in there to help condition the golf course a little bit better for the members. So, so some of this stuff affects the performance in a PGA Tour event. Some of it is just to improve the golf course for the membership, which is. We, I, I had a chance to um, hear an interview with Jack last year, and that's what he spoke about. It's about improving the golf course for the members. So I, I still think you're going to see many of the same questions asked. I still think you're going to see um, many of the same metrics apply this year. Do you think you get a discount on your membership that you haven't been able to play the course for a year? Do you think I don't think that happens, does it? You're still paying yeah. full paying full price, huh? No, I, I mean <laughs> you're more likely to get an assessment. That's right. I don't it think costs more than <laughs> yeah. I don't think Jack would do that. Um, but I wouldn't. I mean, hey, that's typically when you redo a golf course, there's going to be an assessment involved. So I would say no discount. No discount. Actually, we're going to ask you for a little bit more. Okay, gentlemen. So just to kind of get us back into this winners from last year mentioned John Rahm Morikawa beat Justin Thomas in a playoff at the work day. Patrick Cantlay was victorious in 2019. Of course, Bryson DeChambeau in 18 and then some other notables Hideki won it in 2014 and Matt Kuchar in 2013 and see when you look at the field uh, as we do get uh, not only for this event with the the elevated status with it being Jack's event with it being at a great golf course, uh, but also the natural kind of last place to play on the schedule before you take off the Palmetto and then you go to the U.S. Open. This has got a star-studded field. It does, and, and we're going to be looking on, on the DFS preview. We are going to be looking at a lot of the stars, obviously. I, I think Morikawa is definitely in play here, obviously, in terms of a, an outright win. I think Jordan Spieth, I even think Patrick Cantlay, we saw him sort of kind of bounce back recently, and obviously he has good course history here. So there's a lot of big ticket names, but I'll tell you, there's also a lot of the, kind of these, these medium range guys that are, that are starting to kind of like be talked about among the top tier, or at least close to the top tier, like your your ball strikers, like your Keegan Bradleys and your Charlie Hoffmans and your uh, Corey Connors, and of course, like the, the elite guys like Victor Hovland. There's a, there's a lot of guys in play. It's going to be very difficult to sort of parse out who we're going to play, who we're going to bet, and who we're just going to leave on the table. Let's get a couple of the big names here at the top. Let's start, Greg, I suppose, with Rory McIlroy. He makes the cut at the PGA Championship, but I think by his own standards, his T49 would probably be considered a disappointment. Uh, but, of course, the start before that was his victory at Quail Hollow. Now he goes to Mirfield Village. He is certainly someone who is, when, when odds come out on Monday morning, he's going to be one of the shortest guys on the board. Yeah, and I understand that. Um, as much length as he has, he seems to be on the rise. If you look for last heading into this week, a lot of the PGA Championship guys that missed the cut, we still were somewhat high on. It, 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 you didn't necessarily have to perform great in the PGA to perform this week. It's such a different style of golf, and it can be understandable when you don't perform on that golf course. The margins for error are so fine. Um, it, it's not necessarily a sign that your game's in poor form when you play poorly in a uh, on a difficult setup like that. Not necessarily. Um, I think many of the same questions for Rory still exist. Is he going to be able to get the driver in play? It, it plagued him at the Wells Fargo. He won in spite of 
uh, inaccurate driving. And uh, I think it, it harmed him at the PGA Championship as well. So when you hear a golf course is getting a little narrower, they're adding 140 some trees. Is that going to be problematic for Rory? Uh, and then the other thing is when you put new grass on greens, they tend to get a little bit firmer. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes a lot firmer. I know it's harder to get firmer than they were at m- the Memorial <laughs> last year, but I expect them to be really firm. And Rory tends to do really well when greens are a little bit more receptive. Um, so I think he could handle it, but I'm not overly excited about Rory this week. I'm just trying to pick out a couple of names here because there's so many. See, uh, I think Bryson DeChambeau, of course, remains interesting, not only because of what he does with the driver, but the fact that he's kind of been a little loose in recent starts. But we know when things start going in the right direction for him, it's super scary for the rest of the field. And now he goes back to a place where he got his second career PGA Tour victory in 2018. So you'd think there's got to be plenty of good vibes around here. Yeah, but I got to be honest, among the class in this field, he's just not going to be a pick for me, whether it's in the, in the betting market or the DFS market. Again, we'll talk about Bryson more tomorrow, but the approach game really hasn't been there compared to some of these elite guys that, that are, are going to be in the same price range or, or in the same odds range. So yeah, I mean, I think it sets up well for Bryson, but I mean, he's not exactly hitting a ton of fairways either, and, and we know the rough is going to be penal here, and the approach game isn't really great. So I, I think, to me, he's more of a contrarian play, to be honest with you, but I'm sure a lot of people will be on Bryson. I will um, stick with the theme of past champions here, Greg, and we'll go to 2019. We'll go to Patrick Cantlay, and I have no idea what to do with Patrick Cantlay, which is why I ask the questions, and you have to answer them. Uh, He missed three consecutive cuts before kind of steadying himself a little bit at the PGA Championship. He was in it for a while. He finished T23. Of course, he's won this event. He won it in 2019. He finished fourth in 2018. Do we have any idea what the state of his game might be? No, does he, does uh, he know that? Does he know what the state of his game is? <laughs> look, it, I I think the biggest thing is for Patrick. Cant- it, it was so surprising when Patrick Cantlay was struggling. Like we yeah. we always said, it, all right, this has to end. This is going to end, right? All right, he's going to play better this week. That you can just kind of rule that out, rule that, and it just never. It it didn't really get better. Kind of did at the PGA Championship. So I look at Patrick Cantlay. I'm scratching my head. The biggest question for me, see, I want to know your thoughts. Do you think, are you early if you go Patrick Cantlay this week? Because there's there's definitely a gamble and it should, the course should be a great fit for him. But are you, are you early or is, is it, are you kind of late because of the PGA last, <laughs> last time he played? Well, if we're talking about the DFS market, I think you're still a little bit early. Like if, if you had to pick one, I definitely think you're still early. And and that goes back to what Rick said in the beginning. The talent in this field is really high. So Patrick yeah. Cantley is not going to be one of those names that people are going to look at and be like, oh, Patrick Cantley's playing in this tournament. No, they're going to look at Morikawa. They're going to look at Hovland, Spieth, Bryson, Xander. And then Cantley's going to be there. Oh, do I want to be contrarian? I think you're still early with Patrick. So uh, in that case, I think it's, he's uh, he's worth the risk. Is there somebody, Greg, that um, not necessarily, I'm not asking you to predict the winner of this golf tournament here on a Sunday, although you like to try to do that. Is is there someone that you are going to be paying close attention to when on Monday morning those salaries come out and when those odds come out, you're going to be very interested to see what those numbers look like? Um, Hideki Matsuyama is really interesting to me. Um, I I think, one, the course history is is quite good here. Mm -hmm. Um, And two... I like his kind of style that he has, where he's very good with his irons. He's a good driver of the ball, too. Not elite, but he's very good with his irons, and he's very good around the greens. Um, So is his short game going to be able to bail him out? At the Masters, we saw some improved putting. I don't think that was just a a fluke of a hot putting week. I think his stroke actually really did improve. And if he can carry that over into a week like this— where scoring isn't going to get to that 20 under mark more likely than not. You're, you're going to see where uh, this is a course where pars are a little bit better. Good yeah. shots are rewarded, but bad shots are penalized a little bit more at the memorials. So I, I, I think that all of those factors give Hideki a really good chance. To add a little bit of context to what Greg is mentioning, the winning score last year was nine under. That was John Rahm. He was three shots better than anybody else. And that the next person was Ryan Palmer. They're their they're buddies, they're partners at the Zurich Classic. They went one two last year. And then for Hideki, after his victory in 2014, he actually has two more top tens at Muirfield Village since then. So he's played very well here. See, uh, the guys that I'm interested in, and I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I'm very interested to 
to see a little bit further down the board what Keegan Bradley's number is, what Tony Finau's number is, and what Billy Horschel's number is. Those are the three that I'm going to be keeping a close eye on. Billy Horschel's got you know four top 25s in six years. Finau has played well here, and then Keegan. I believe Keegan is laying the blueprint. See, uh, he's got he's gaining a lot more with the putter. We've talked about him in recent weeks. He's certainly trending in the right direction. You guys always do this. Last week it was Greg. Guess who's number one in my model? The, the, again, it's a preliminary model, but it is in fact Keegan Bradley. I, I mean, I, I I love the guy. He's he's improved in all the places where we sort of like used to make fun of him. You know, so at this point, you're right. He is. I, I think he's due. I mean, in this field, is he actually going to do it? I'm not so sure about that, but I'm curious to see what his number is at and what his DFS price is at. All right, gentlemen. Um, anything else? Mirfield Village, Memorial, Jack Nicholas golf related that we want to talk about before we get out of here i'll just say I, I can't wait to see what it plays out to be uh, yeah. i can't wait to hear from the players i can't wait to hear uh everybody's sentiment so as we get into tomorrow and we get into um the remainder of the week tuesday I, i'm really looking forward to all of the the new breakdowns we have DFS preview on Monday, same team that we have on right now. Mega preview pod on Tuesday, and of course, round by round coverage at the conclusion of each. But for now, let me thank producer Jacob. He does all the hard work behind the scenes. Let me thank Sia Najad, who you can find on Twitter at Sia Najad. Let me thank Greg Ducharme, who you can find at The Real GFD. And you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut, and we'll catch you next time.